For almost three years, AEW was the biggest babyface in wrestling. They had five-star in-ring matches, they had long-term storytelling, and they had all your favourite wrestlers that WWE had fired. But then, the most perfectly executed double turn since Bret Hart and Stone Cold at WrestleMania 13 happened. Tony Khan accidentally turned his entire promotion heel. At the exact same time, Triple H turned WWE face. I'm Ollie Davis, and this is how WWE is f***ing with AEW. As Harvey Dent once said, You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. In wrestling startup terms, that time period is three years, eight months, and three days. Which is how long it took between AEW's founding on the 1st of January 2019, to the moment CM Punk nuked his own career, the promotion he worked for, and all of its top stars on the 4th of September 2022. If Punk had dropped his bitch bomb at any other time, AEW would have been in a much stronger position because the alternative was still far worse. The alternative's name was Vince McMahon. You might not remember him, kids. It's been a long year. But if you want to picture him, imagine that a horny, egomaniac bully was running the world's biggest wrestling promotion unopposed for two decades. It, 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 was, it was hilarious. But after dedicating his entire career to sports entertainment, Vince decided to respectfully call it a day. Slash was forced out of the company because of mounting investigations into sexual misconduct. Vince was replaced by Stupid son-in-law. Triple H. Thing is, Triple H isn't a doofus. His nickname is the Cerebral Assassin for a reason. Punk's bitch bomb didn't happen in isolation. It came at the exact same time Triple H had taken power in WWE, creating the perfect alignment for Triple H to start really screwing with AEW. But first, a short history on Triple H. It's all about the game and how you play it. It's easy to forget while he pushes your favourites and brings back Bray Wyatt, but nobody liked Triple H for the majority of his career. He ruined other people's pushes. He had boring matches. He was a chief plotter of the Montreal Screwjob. He once did a racism storyline with Booker T and put himself over. Because that's the message, kids. Racism wins. We didn't like Triple H for 15 years. But then the devil played his greatest trick. He convinced us he never existed. Paul Levesque created an indie wrestling brand that was so beloved, we all forgot he hated indie wrestling. When indie wrestling first started to push its way into WWE, funnily enough, in the hiring of CM Punk, Hunter and many other veterans were resistant to the new style. Indie wrestlers were smaller, vanilla midgets who only wrestled in bingo halls. But this is where Hunter's arguably most devastating trait first became apparent. He's adaptable. Admirably, Triple H changed his mind about what pro wrestling is, and what a pro wrestler looked and performed like. He did AEW before AEW, making NXT a beloved indie-style brand with the production capabilities of WWE. That's when he proved he could be different to Vince. He told coherent storylines. He really, 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 really liked entrances. He put on arguably the greatest run of back-to-back -back major shows of the modern era, unironically called takeovers. Real, real subtle trips. With NXT, Triple H actually made himself the hottest young prospect in wrestling. Not build in anticipation for a main roster call-up, not to become world champion, not to main event WrestleMania, but for him to take over the whole WWE. Like any good wrestling psychology, the heel cut off the hope spots. Vince broke up NXT acts like Enzo and Big Cass. He put Karrion Cross in a gimp mask. He even gave the black and gold a multicolored midlife crisis. Hello, fellow kids. How about them boobs? By then, Triple H's very career and life were hanging in doubt. After going head to head for over a year, he lost the Wednesday Night Wars to AEW, and NXT retreated to Tuesday nights. At the same time, Triple H suffered a very real life heart issue. It was so serious, he had to take his first long-term break from the company to recover. Triple H was on the brink. The sleeper was locked in tight. His arm dropped once, twice. Mass sexual misconduct investigation makes the save. Yes, mass sexual misconduct investigation. Vince honorably removed himself from his position. Slash hung on with the unrelenting grip of career rigor mortis until it was prized from his cold, dead fingers. And Triple H, just months after being on the brink of defeat, suddenly found himself booking the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. He couldn't have booked a better storyline for himself if he tried. And now, 
it was time to get revenge. If you're enjoying this video, by the way, hey, click the subscribe button. We've got daily wrestling news and reviews videos on WrestleTalk, along with predictions, lists, and more. Make sure to enable notifications to always on so you get the latest breaking news to you first. And check us out on Patreon too, where we've got a huge exclusive archive of classic wrestling review podcasts. There's even a perk where you can get a video call with us. We did it first, Cameo! Some Greek guy once said, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. But good luck for Triple H was bad luck for Tony Khan. Just one month after Hunter replaced Vince McMahon, the locker room split between CM Punk and The Elite became embarrassingly public at All Out. After three years of being the ultimate wrestling babyface, AEW had multiple issues come to a head at the same time. A bloated roster, creative frustrations, and wrestlers resenting the former WWE stars taking their spots. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And not only did Triple H find himself in the top WWE job after decades of waiting, it happened at the exact same time his newest foe was at its weakest. So let's grab the sledgehammer and whack them in the nuts while they're on the ropes. But only with your hand covering the most important part of the weapon. You won't want to hurt anyone. Sledgehammer number one the talent. On the 24th of August, just before that night's episode of Dynamite, and under two weeks away from when the company imploded at All Out, Tony Khan held a talent meeting to discuss how WWE had been approaching wrestlers under AEW contracts. Chris Jericho had already strongly hinted he was one of those approached, tweeting with the hashtag TAMPERING. Fightful Select later confirmed Swerve Strickland, FTR, and Malachi Black were also amongst those contacted. It seemed like WWE, under Triple H's new regime, was reaching out to everyone who had a connection with Hunter from the NXT glory days. And if you've been watching AEW over the last two years, that's practically their entire mid-card. The approaches were so flagrant, AEW's chief legal officer, Mega Parrick, sent an email to WWE CEO Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan saying not to tamper with AEW talent. But I say, if you're an evil mastermind running a wrestling company, why not? Strategy-wise, this would be a wickedly effective, low-risk ploy by Triple H. At the absolute worst, WWE gets a legal warning from AEW while they argue employ plausible deniability. Oh, we were just inquiring about your status right now, Chris Jericho. How are we to know you're signed with AEW, Chris Jericho? All the while sowing seeds of doubt amongst the AEW locker room that maybe the Triple H WWE grass really is greener. And when I say green, I mean, I mean money. Loads and loads of money. But at its best, several of those wrestlers you sent light feelers to got remembering the NXT good times and subsequently asked for their release from AEW. <laughs> I'm not saying those are connected, but since those first contract tampering reports came out, there have been strong insinuations that Malachi Black, Buddy Matthews and Andrade have all tried to get out of their AEW contracts. All wrestlers who were very close to Triple H in the NXT 205 Live days. By just making a few phone calls, WWE could have stoked those feelings of locker room resentment, potentially adding to the kindling that would eventually explode two weeks later at All Out. Sledgehammer number two, the events. Counter-programming is nothing new in the AEW-WWE war, it's just been elevated. Since Triple H took charge, he now has the full might of the main roster added to his shared WWE Google Calendar. Adding to the all-out weekend pressure, piling on top of AEW's own inattention and WWE's alleged contract tampering, Triple H counter-programmed NXT Worlds Collide to happen on the exact same Sunday. And this was no Bron Breaker versus Joe Gacy multicolor match, this was a hastily but effectively booked NXT NXT UK invasion angle, unifying multiple championship belts and putting indie favourite Tyler Bate in the main event. Ever since, WWE has used NXT as the perfect counter-programming weapon, stacking shows with just the right level of main roster stars like Rhea Ripley or Ricochet, where if NXT loses, it's no biggie, it's not like Brock Lesnar was on it, but if they win, they can boast about their developmental brand beating an AEW at full strength. They loaded October's Halloween Havoc with main roster mid-carders when it went up against a dynamite that had to shift to Tuesday. While AEW suffered from not being in its regular slot, NXT was only 76,000 viewers away in the ratings. WWE is also planning an NXT Premium Live event for the 10th of December, the same day as Tony Khan's final Ring of Honor pay-per-view of the year, Final Battle. Expect NXT to target Ring of Honor 
more and more. It gets overlooked because of the punk bitch bomb, but in that same post all out media scrum, Tony Khan cut a pipe bomb of his own on WWE consistently counter programming shows on the same days as his. And there's a big difference between this year and last year. I was a little surprised we were the third professional wrestling show this weekend. This is not a game to me. This is uh, my life, and I don't think it's a joke. When I compare myself to Jim Crockett Promotions this weekend, I think I got a taste of the same medicine Jim Crockett Promotions took. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot more f***ing money than Jim Crockett did. <laughs> and I'm not going to get, I'm serious, I'm not going to sit back and take this f***ing sh that is not a guy in control of his emotions. A conspiracy theory of contract tampering would be enough on its own. Counter-programming to such a degree appears to have deeply affected Khan, going by his response at that media scrum. Sledgehammer 3, The Reputation. It's a tale as old as time. WWE release your favorite wrestler. There's an outpouring of fan and industry support for said favorite wrestler. So then reports start to come out to say that it was said favorite wrestler's fault. Keith Lee just had, in general, attitude issues. Bray Wyatt was being difficult. CM Punk was hard to deal with. Okay, maybe that last one was onto something. Budget cuts might not be the only made-up reason WWE fires people. There's a theory that those negative reports on released wrestlers being difficult to work with are actually planted stories by WWE themselves. And since Triple H has taken charge of WWE, we've seen a very similar approach to AEW as a whole. On the 10th of October episode of Monday Night Raw, WWE celebrated 25 years of Degeneration X. Oh my god, it's been that long. Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Shawn Mortman, and the road dog Jesse James were all in attendance, but there was one notable name missing. Hornswoggle! Yeah, he was a DX member for about three weeks in 2009. The definitive iteration of DX. You son of a bitch! Oh yeah, and Billy Gunn wasn't there either, because he's under contract with AEW. Road Dog publicly said not having his best buddy Billy Gunn there broke my heart, and I believe it broke his too. Hunter was not happy about it either. Sean and X-Pac weren't either. According to Road Dog, just the day before, Billy Gunn was all approved to join the reunion. After all, he'd already made one WWE appearance while under AEW contract at DX's Hall of Fame 2019 induction. But then that cruel Tony Khan scrapped the plans last minute. Road Dog continued. It was a big deal and I feel like he got ripped off and didn't live it with us. I'm sorry for that. I know he is too. I don't know the exact reason, but I was told everything that we could do was done and we couldn't come together. AEW is such an evil company. Imagine them pulling the exact same cynical stunts that WWE have done for about four decades. Thing is though, it's um, it's not true. AEW have reportedly approved Gunn to appear on Raw under one condition, not a payment, not a talent appearance loan the other way, not even to maybe stop counter-programming Ring of Honor shows. All Tony Khan wanted in exchange for Gunn was that WWE commentary just mentioned that Daddy Ass is from AEW and WWE declined. What was that? What was that quote again, Road Dog? I was told everything that we could do was done. Everything, apart from possibly the easiest thing you could do. Expect stories like these to come out more and more, subtly painting AEW as the promotion that's difficult to work with, turning fans and potentially future wrestling company partnerships against them. Speaking of segue. What do you want to do tonight? Triple H. The same thing we do every night. Sure, Michaels. Try to take over the world. The There's one unique selling point that AEW currently has over WWE. An entire world of wrestling promotions. WWE under Vince McMahon was more isolationist than your angry uncle's views on globalized supply chains. WWE didn't work with anyone and in the very rare cases that they did, they would quickly change their minds and destroy the relationship. It's almost like WWE a uh, difficult to work with. But when Triple H walked into the head booker office, he appears to have left the door slightly open. Hunter's openness to working with other promotions can be seen in his years running NXT. He brought in Jushin Thunder Liger to wrestle on NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. When Samoa Joe first joined NXT, he was actually free to continue working for other promotions. The first Cruiserweight Classic in 2016 saw Zack Sabre Jr. and Kota Ibushi both reach the semi-finals, despite neither being signed. 
Now, in the months since Triple H took control of WWE, there have been several similar cracks in the forbidden door. NWA president Billy Corgan revealed he has had optimistic talks with Triple H. Rey Mysterio sent a video message to Triple A for their Triple Mania anniversary show. Shinsuke Nakamura is being allowed to wrestle a match in Pro Wrestling Noah as part of the Great Muta's retirement tour. Carl Anderson made his return to WWE while still holding New Japan's Never Openweight Championship. WWE CEO Nick Khan even tried to broker a New Japan working relationship in 2021. But there is a counterpoint to this argument. Hunter might have another completely opposite philosophy in his head. And that completely opposite philosophy is called global localization. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. The business plan, announced by Triple H in 2018, was for WWE to set up local branches of NXT around the world. WWE is a global brand, and now there will be geographically local versions of it. Why not call it WWE Japan? That's the more recognizable brand name. It didn't go so well, with NXT UK shuttering its doors after four years as one of WWE's first big post-Vince business moves. But it was then announced NXT UK would be replaced by NXT Europe, and Shawn Michaels, who now runs NXT, has promised NXT Japan and NXT Mexico are in the company's future. If that really is the idea, I can't see long-term relationships with promotions like New Japan, All Japan, CMLL or AAA while you're setting up direct competitors to them on their turf. It's a risky strategy that could go either way, as is Triple H's final sledgehammer, detonating a pipe bomb all of his own. This is officially the burial of anything that I had going for me. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say it. I'm, I'm gonna say the thing. CM Punk to WWE confirmed. The most impactful on-screen sledgehammer that Triple H could swing at AEW is also the one that could continue to whip round and smash him square in the face, bringing CM Punk back to WWE. There's a kind of poetry in it, in a way. Triple H and CM Punk, two men that apparently can't stand each other, but who have actually become increasingly like each other over the decade they spent apart. Triple H embracing Punk's indie style, and Punk becoming a politicker at the top of a wrestling promotion. As much as CM Punk had arguably the greatest wrestling comeback of all time, the episode of Rampage where he made his AEW debut was only watched by 1.13 million viewers, most of whom had just been cutting onions. Raw in 2022 has averaged well over half a million more per episode. SmackDown almost doubles it. Just going by the numbers, a punk WWE return would have been far more mainstream successful than his AEW one. Plus the added embarrassment as the man who never lost the AEW world title showing up at its main competitor. Maybe even a year after the company co-founder Cody Rhodes Jump ship too. Cody and Punk were also WWE stooges sent to AEW to destroy the promotion from the inside, but that's the subject of another video. Triple H once said, it's a marathon, not a sprint in the AEW versus WWE war. Then you see him load up NXT shows and counter-program AEW and think, yeah right mate, seems like you're running full pelt there. But I can't get this over enough. It's not about the individual battles. That's what Triple H is talking about when he says marathons. It's about applying consistent pressure over time to force your enemy into making a mistake. And maybe with the counter-programming and the contract tampering and the undermining comments and the threat to their global partnerships all on his plate, Tony Khan didn't prioritize the personnel issues in his own locker room. I'm saying there's an argument that Triple H, the cerebral assassin, helped cause CM Punk's media scrum bitch bomb. What other ways do you think WWE is screwing with AEW and how do you think AEW could best defend themselves or even go on the counter-attack? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below and I'll try to reply to as many of them as I can. And also, if you like this video and you aren't already, give us a subscribe. We put out daily wrestling news and review videos, predictions and opinion pieces like this. And if you want to be even more awesome, head over to patreon.com forward slash wrestle talk and become a pledge hammer there or you'll get loads of exclusive wrestling content. Will AEW getting rid of CM Punk actually be their biggest ever mistake? Watch on to find out.